website later. Um, I'm Lily Thomas, and I work for the Community Development Agency. And we have um, a team of us here that I'll just start with introducing us um, before we get started on the presentation. Aline Tanillion is a planner who works with us, as is Edgardo Vasquez, and Leslie Laco um, is a senior planner also in the Community Development Agency, and you'll be hearing from her later about the safety element. Um, so let's see, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is our agenda for tonight. We'll just give some background for anybody who um, hasn't heard our presentation before. Also, if um, you may have forgotten some of the information, we're gonna go give a, a brief overview on of what the housing element is. Then we're going to um, talk about, we we submitted our draft, to the our draft housing element to the state for their review, and we got some comments back that we're going to share with you. And then we're going to go over some of the amendments that there were, we are proposing to the countywide plan and the development code to implement the housing element. And then we'll turn it over to Leslie, who's going to talk about the safety element, what it is and some changes to our um, code related to the safety element. And we'll talk about next steps and opportunities for you to stay involved. And then we'll go to Q, um, question and answers. Um, and we'll un you can unmute at that time and, and ask questions. In the meantime, if you need clarification, or if I use some acronyms that you're not familiar with, go ahead and drop that in the chat and we'll be watching and trying to answer those questions as we go along. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aline for the housing element background. Thank you, Lily. So yeah, as Lily said, uh, for those of you that have um, heard this presentation, you'll likely know this information, but it'll be a overview for those who haven't. So the housing element is updated every eight years and it's part of the county's um, larger general plan. And in the county, we call that the county-wide plan which is essentially the long-term vision for unincorporated Berlin. Um, so the housing element component of the countywide plan is required to be reviewed by the state, by the California Department of Housing and Community Development, which is also known as HCD. We have an adoption deadline for the end of January of next year, so January 31st, 2023. And the housing element we're going to discuss tonight um, is for the unincorporated areas of the county. Each individual jurisdiction is required to complete their own housing element. Um, and also to provide just a little bit of context, the unit goal that was assigned to unincorporated Marin for this next housing element is at least 3,569 units, and it's about 14,000 for the county as a whole. So this slide provides um, an overview of the major components of the, of the housing element, beginning to the left with the needs assessment. This section um, analyzes and reviews demographic trends and in addition to housing market trends and identifies the needs of special needs groups. The following section here is affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is also known as AFFH. This is a newer section to the housing element and requires us to look at the housing element from this lens. So looking at our housing sites, where they're distributed, um, ensuring that there's fair housing choices for all in that distribution and our programs and policies um, to advance what are called meaningful actions. In addition to this, the next section here, the sites inventory is the section that receives a lot of attention in the housing element. This is the section that identifies the location of sites and sets the units by income levels as noted here. And then last but not least, we have programs and policies, a very important aspect to the housing element. It's essentially the implementation plan for the housing element and includes programs like the topics noted here, increasing the availability of units, affirmatively furthering fair housing and addressing the housing needs of special populations in the county. On this slide, you'll see the programs that are required to be aligned with state law. By right zoning policy, uh, Lily's gonna talk about this a little bit later in the presentation. You may have heard this term before. It essentially applies to sites that have been identified in previous housing element cycles 
um, and would streamline the development process. In addition to that, there's um, the requirement to have programs that incentivize affordable housing production and that streamline county development timelines. Um, some of you may have seen this map before. It's a overview of the candidate housing sites that have been identified in unincorporated Marin. And as you can see, there are sites in virtually all areas of, of unincorporated county of the county, um, which is again to promote fair housing choices for all in the community. On this slide, you'll see some of the major consequences of non-compliance. Um, HCD has a new unit called the Housing Accountability Unit. Um, this unit is tasked with not only ensuring jurisdictions are following compliance throughout the approval process of the housing element, but they're also going to be tasked with monitoring um, housing elements throughout the next um, cycle, so throughout the next eight years and beyond. Um, another noted consequence is the loss of access to funding opportunities like road and transportation funds. There are also a number of housing funds provided by the state, like permanent local housing allocation dollars and other matching funds that the county has actually received to date. It would also open up the possibility of a lawsuit uh, from the state, which they have recently done in Southern California, like in Huntington Beach. And it would also create the requirement for the jurisdiction to update their housing element every four years, as opposed to every eight years in addition to the responsibility to plan for an even larger number of units. So um, this is a timeline overview of the process. We're now in the fifth bubble, the bottom middle bubble. Um, we have received, we sent in our draft housing element to the state and received our comment letter back. Lily's going to go through that in the next section. And we're now preparing for um, planning commission and board of supervisor consideration for final approval um, at, by the end of January. Lily? Thanks, Aline. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so as we mentioned, we made the housing element, the draft of the housing element available for public review during the month of June. We received over 140 comments that were then incorporated into the draft that was submitted to the state for their review. Before we can submit our state we, or our housing element, the state has to review it and provide comments on the draft, which they did um, beginning in they had it from July and they gave us our comments back in October. And um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and before I dive into those comments, we um, have been tracking other um, Bay Area jurisdictions, cities, towns, and counties that have been receiving their letters that are a little farther ahead of us. There's about 10 of them. And some of the main comments that we're see seeing is that while fair housing has been a main theme in other comment letters, that's a common thing because it's new, Marin County had received minimal comments, so we were pleased with that. And um, we also didn't receive any comments on our outreach and participation, which is really different than other jurisdictions, which have received substantial comments. There's a more robust um, public engagement process required now under the affirmatively furthering fair housing requirement that Aline talked about. So, um, and we were fortunate to not get any comments about that. So we were pleased with, with that also. Um, and then other, um, uh, other cities and towns and counties um, got a lot of comments back about their sites. Many were trying to, um, you know, required a, a significant changes to it, and that was not the case in, in ours. So let's move to the next slide. Um, and in general, the framework of our housing element was strong. In particular, HCD noted that we had done a, real, a good job on our fair housing work and on our outreach. And with the level of changes needed, we'll be able to meet the statutory deadline. And um, 
some of the main comments on the needs assessment and the needs assessment, um, remember, is really where we establish what our local needs are and look at special needs um, populations that are in need of housing. We needed to add some more data and some analysis to it. For example, we needed to look a little bit more in depth into some of our populations who are experiencing homelessness to look at trends and analysis in that area. Um, constraints to development, we um, were asked to add um, some more information about fees, for example. Um, we needed to analyze fees in addition to our own fees, but fees that were charged by other jurisdictions or other agencies and how those may be a barrier to housing. And then on our sites, they did ask for a little bit more analysis, particularly looking at development trends in our community, which are a little challenging because we don't have a lot of development here. So we're going to be looking at some neighboring cities and towns as well as neighboring counties to try to get some development trends that we can can look at. Um, they also wanted to make sure that if we were using mixed uh, use zoning that the existing uses on those sites were not a constraint to development. So that's the kind of things that they were looking at in that section. And then in policies and programs, our work plan, they asked for a little bit more specificity and timeline. For example, we have a program that, that talks about water. And, you know, obviously we have been experiencing significant drought and um, accommodating um, a lot of new homes is a challenge for us. So they they, we had a program in there related to water, but they asked for some more detail and for us to talk about whether there's any funding opportunities that we could explore further. So that those are there was a couple of other programs and policies that asked for that kind of information. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So um, now I'll move into talking about some of the countywide plan and development code changes that we are going to be looking at. Um, the, so the countywide plan is the document that the where the county sets the long term vision for the unincorporated part of the county, and it was first adopted in 1974. We last updated it in 2007, and it has three main sections: um, the natural systems and agricultural element that will include the safety element that um, Leslie will talk about a little later. The built environment where the housing element that we're updating now will be incorporated and then the socioeconomic element. Next slide. And the development code is really the where it implements that vision. Um, it has our zoning, it has our development standards, processing regulations. So it's where all the kind of nitty gritty part of it is and the countywide plan is much more kind of visionary. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So we are making changes to the countywide plan in order to ensure fair housing and address, address those fair housing requirements that Aline talked about earlier. We have to, under state law, reduce barriers to multi-unit development, um, comply with other new state laws. Um, it, <laughs> The legislature seems to pass new housing related laws every year, so we have to make changes to accommodate those, um, the changes in state law. Um, we need to make some changes in order to accomplish that, re that regional housing need allocation. Um, as Elaine mentioned, it's, 30, it's over 3,500, and so we are going to have to do some rezoning, et cetera, in order and make some changes to our policies to, to get to that that significantly higher number than we had before. We also need to address special needs housing. Um, and uh, we're gonna, I'll go through some of these um, changes. Next slide, please. So a number of countywide plan policies we are going to be recommending to the um, planning commission and board that they be eliminated in order for us to be able to meet those housing needs. So for example, there's a policy that requires development to be at the low end of the density range in certain areas along the Baylands corridor and areas that are on septic or wells. And so 
we are going to recommend that that program be eliminated. Of course, environmental protections will still be in place, and you know any development has to provide has to be able to provide sanitary and water, but um, just not that it be blanketly um, has to develop at the lowest end of the density range. And sorry, this stuff is a little bit wonky, but these are the the programs we would just want to make sure that everyone's familiar with with what we're proposing. Um, another is to limit development. Um, currently, we have a policy that limits development to the low end of the density range, and the density range is in the countywide plan. It'll say something like, you know, eleven to thirty units an acre, and in on these programs. Any site that is meets this criteria has to only develop at that let 11 unit um, range. And currently it says that any sites that are next to a city or town, so really sites that are next to urbanized areas, has to develop at the low end of the density range. And it was intended to encourage um, annexation, but that's not really happening in Moran. Most cities and towns are not expanding. And so really what it's ended up doing is pushing development away from where services are and transportation are focused to, to areas that are farther away. Um, so we're recommending to eliminate that program. Next slide, please. Um, the board is also designated um, two larger regional sites to help accomplish the, um, that RENA that we're planning for, including um, St. Vincent's and the Buck Center. And there are some changes that are being made to St. Vincent's um, currently uh, they've, we've identified about 40 acres of that property that are outside of hazards like sea level rise or other environmental resources. And so development will be focused there. And there's a number of, of changes to the countywide plan policies to be able to do that. Next slide. And then on the Buck Center site, it's not actually where the Buck Center is, but it's on the same property. It's kind of down closer next to the freeway and it's in unincorporated, um, it's in the, it's in near Nevada, but in unincorporated county um, jurisdiction. And um, it's currently in the, the county has three different um, or has four different planning corridors the city center corridor, which is next to the freeway, there's the West Marin and uh, um, the coastal zone, and then there's the inland rural cor corridor. And current, and it's supposed to be the most intensive development is in that city center corridor. So this proposal is to move the the line of the city center corridor to accommodate that little red part where development is most likely to happen at the center. Um, so moving the city center corridor to more accurately reflect the development that's really there. There's commercial development and higher density right next door in Novato. Next slide, please. Um, there's also some policy changes recommended to our community plans and community plans um, establish goals, objectives, policies, and programs for a specific community, but some of them have aspects of the community, some of the aspects of community plans are inconsistent with state law and have the effect of limiting multi-unit housing. And so those, and currently the policy says that if a countywide plan, if there's a conflict between a community plan and a countywide plan that the community plan governs, if it's more specific. And so um, the recommendation that we have is to change that. Um, so where community plans um, retain their role is where they, or where there's a conflict between the community plan and the countywide plan, the countywide plan will um, govern rather than the community plan. And that will allow us to plan for some multi-unit housing in some of our, in, in most of our communities. Um, next slide. Um, the another concept that we need to accommodate in our development code is around the default density. So HCD, the state says that in order for housing to be, um, in order to uh, have 
um, housing that that is that lower income housing that we need to plan for. We need to have it zoned at at least the default density for that community. And in Marin, the default density is at least 20 units an acre. And so that's really intended to make it more less expensive to develop affordable housing. So if you can have more, given that land is so expensive and development costs are so expensive, if you can do a little higher density, then that makes it more financially feasible for affordable housing. So we'll be looking at rezoning some of our sites to accommodate um, housing at the default density. Next slide, please. Um, Aline mentioned that um, some of our sites will have what's called by right. And by right means that approvals, rather than going through a typical discretionary process, that they have to be done by right. And so you have to look at just kind of objective standards um, when you are evaluating a project. And that could be like height, setback, but it couldn't fit like, um, you know, something that wasn't as, uh, you know, something arbitrary. It has to be very measurable. And um, so if a site has been in our housing element in two previous housing elements and it hasn't developed in order for us to reuse that site, we need to have it zoned with that by right standard. And the goal of this is really to get, um, and, and these are for projects that, that contain a percentage of, of units that are affordable. And it's really to get it the the barrier of having many, many, many hearings, public hearings, which can make a project take longer and get more expensive. We had a project, a senior project that developed in one of our towns that took 13 public hearings recently. And so the by right is intended to avoid that barrier for affordable housing. Next slide, please. Um, and just some of our, just to touch briefly on the zoning. Some of our sites are larger and so we'll be a, we'll be rezoning a portion of that site at that default density that we mentioned in order to accommodate the number of units that the, the board and planning commission have designated on that site. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over and sorry, that was a lot. I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie to give you an update on the uh, safety element. Just to remind you, if you have any questions, while either on what I just went through or what Leslie is going to talk about, go ahead and drop them in the chat if you need an answer right now, or we'll be saving some time at the end to answer your questions live. Leslie. Thanks, Lily. Uh, so the safety element is the part of the countywide plan that contains our programs and policies related to public safety, especially from environmental hazards. Next slide. And one of the reasons, um, one of the benefits of, of updating the safety element alongside the housing element is because the safety element does make housing safer. It does this by generally improving hazard safety so the county is a safer place to develop. Uh, it also contains programs and policies that specify development requirements so that uh, the actual construction of new housing is safer. And then it also uh, makes the county generally safer by planning for equitable protection from environmental hazards and especially climate change hazards. Next slide. So new state requirements um, are in place and they require that we update the safety element every eight years along with the housing element. And this is the first of those eight years. And the focus of the requirements is on climate change adaptation and resiliency. So we are looking at environmental hazards that are exacerbated by climate change and new environmental hazards as a result of climate change. The first step that's required is to assess the county's vulnerability to climate change impacts, and really the range of impacts. So, about a year ago now, we prepared a vulnerability assessment and brought that to the public. 
Um, we we looked at the impacts of climate change. Sorry about the background noise, if you can hear it. Um, and uh, one of the things that became very clear was that there are some populations that are impacted much more by climate change. They're much more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change for a number of reasons. So the draft safety element really emphasizes equity and the needs of vulnerable communities, as well as emphasizing um, the climate change impacts and how we uh, develop safely around climate change. Next slide. The existing safety element has, um, has policies related to environmental hazards already. Those are policies on uh, geologic hazards, on flooding, and on wildfire. And what we've done in this update is we have some new policy areas. So we have a new section on equity. The wildfire section is much more robust than it was and really geared towards um, some of the new wildfire hazards associated with climate change. We have a new section on disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery, and then a new climate change adaptation and resiliency planning section. And in that section, we address sea level rise, severe weather, extreme heat, and drought. Now the safety element has, uh, we have a draft safety element that was released to the public on June 1st. Um, and it was also sent to the Board of Forestry um, who oversees CAL FIRE. The requirement is that CAL FIRE has to review and approve safety elements now. So uh, through the summer, we've responded to public comments and made some changes in the draft safety element. We have um, gone back and forth a bit with CAL FIRE. Uh, and eventually the Board of Forestry approved our draft safety element that was on September 22nd of this year. And then on October 11th, we brought the changes back to the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission uh, for their review. So that's where we're at with the safety element. One of the new things that we're doing is um, is following one of the programs in the safety element that directs us to update the Bayfront Conservation and Combining District to address sea level rise. Thank you, Aline. <laughs> so the Bayfront Conservation and Combining District is um, an overlay or, or a combining district. It combines with other zoning designations. Um, so these are zoning designations um, that are more subjective in nature. They're really for um, uh, discretionary reviews. The original purpose of the Bayfront Conservation Combining District is to protect habitat and public safety and views. And this amendment is really focused on the protection of people, property, and habitat from sea level rise. Next slide. The Bayfront Conservation Combining District is shown here in gold. So it, it doesn't just cover the entire Bay shoreline because it only can cover those areas that are in unincorporated Marin County. Um, also shown on this map is uh, this blue hatched area, and that represents 3.3 feet of sea level rise. So the area that we're targeting with this development code amendment is the intersection of those gold areas, the Bayfront Conservation areas, and 3.3 feet of sea level rise. So you can see in some areas it covers the entire um, Bayfront Conservation Area and others, uh, it's just partially. Next slide. What we are aiming to achieve with this amendment is um, first to identify a specific sea level rise scenario, which, um, 
that being 3.3 feet of sea level rise. The draft safety element directs us to be consistent with uh, California state sea level rise guidance and scenarios. And that is the current guidance is to use um, between 3.3 and 3.5 feet of sea level rise. Uh, so that defines that the area that we're looking at. And then the other, one of the other objectives is to require that all new and habitable development uh, is sited upland and as high as possible. So really is as far as possible from the tideline, basically. Um, and then also where shoreline protection projects are proposed, uh, we require that nature-based measures be assessed before a hard shoreline armoring project could be approved. So we wanna make sure that that, you, that their nature-based measures are not feasible before we move on to approving any hard shoreline uh, protection devices. And the reason for that is that hard shoreline armoring has negative environmental impacts and can sometimes create more erosion problems than sea level rise alone would cause. And then finally, uh, we've uh, included a disclosure uh, acknowledging the risk and liability of developing new habitable structures that are subject to sea level rise. And uh, with that, I'll hand this back to the housing team. Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie. Sorry, I was trying to answer somebody's question in the in the chat. Um, so the next steps that we are taking, we are addressing the comments that the state gave us. Um, we reviewed those changes with them, and um, they agreed in general to our approach. Um, and we have a discussion with the board on December 6th to finalize our sites list based on changes to some circumstances on a number of our sites. And um, we will be preparing the draft for adoption. Next slide, please. Um, there's, a, as uh, we mentioned, there's also environmental review that is currently underway. Um, and there is a board and planning commission workshop um, next Wednesday. It's not the normal time, so please note that it's on Wednesday, November 6th at 5 o'clock. And that will be an opportunity for people to provide comments on issues that are related to the impact of the housing and safety element. So somebody asked about traffic impacts and water impacts, and that would be a, a good time to provide comment. You can either do that in person or you can send an email or a letter. Um, we have a, a workshop with First Five Marin um, coming up also next week on the 17th to talk about kind of what, what happens after the housing element and talk about some of our programs and policies that we'll be working on next year. Um, as I mentioned on or December 6th, sorry, uh, we have that, that workshop with the board about sites. And then actually these workshops, this is our final one. So I, I won't go through those, um, but we've been doing these around the county. So next slide, please. All right, now we'll, we could maybe just turn off the, that and then we'll, we'll go through and answer your questions. So thanks everybody. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll start with Valerie. You have your hand raised and I was gonna say others, if you're in, if you wanna ask a question, go ahead and raise your virtual hand or your physical hand. Um, and you could ask your question and then we'll read out some of the chat questions, but Valerie, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much for recognizing me. And you all have got this all well thought out and it sounds lovely. And I understand your concern about the sea rising, but um, to say that this is built in low density areas and stuff like that, uh, there's a, I call it Haraki Park in Mill Valley. It's a very, very crowded intersection already it's dangerous and i don't think it's just 11 units on a hillside no planned parking but number one 
we don't have the water supply. I would love to all the wide open spaces, build it. I would love that more than anything, but we don't have the water supply. And uh, Marin Water District, I don't know if you listen to their board meetings, but they just announced that with the rain that we have now, apparently they have barrels that collect rainwater. They've just closed them. Well, I at home am squeezing water out of a stone. But anyway, I just don't understand that. But also with this environmental planning and things like that, I know for a fact, well, Mill Valley's had a terrible time for 30 years trying to get fire insurance. I know they're planning on building in Lafayette and places that homeowners already can't get fire insurance, but the developers are planning on building there. And I'm sorry, you guys, but these aren't low density areas. And in Mill Valley, I don't know if you're familiar with the area. You sound very smart, but I, but I don't know. But they don't have room. We've got such problems now with accessible roadways. You have to time when you go into Mill Valley and when you come out. And we're already crowded. We've got a water shortage. We have no, absolutely no room for evacuation. And one of the um, state bills was signed. I can't remember if it was 124 or 128, because they're like alphabet soup, if you know what I mean. And, but it says water and fire protection aren't an issue. And uh, I, I know if you know what happened to Costa Rica, um, uh, Valerie, can can yes. we just put a pause because I want to make sure that I that you have sure. a couple questions in there and I want to make sure that I can answer it. So sure. first of all, I wanted to clarify the specific site that you were mentioning is in the city of Mill Valley. And yeah. they also, it, you know, when we talk about the county, we're only talking about the unincorporated county. And Interesting. Every city and town in Marin and actually around the whole state is also planning for housing. So we're doing a housing element. Mill Valley is doing a housing element. Tiburon, Belvedere, everybody has to do their own housing element. So that site that you talked about at Hockey Park is actually in the city of Mill Valley and everybody is required to um, plan for housing. And obviously the impacts of all that housing are related, right? Because we share the same water and traffic impacts are going to affect all of us. So one of the things that the environmental review, and I am not an expert in this field, but one of the things that the environmental review does is actually look at those kind of cumulative impacts altogether. So I think that that would be a really good point to bring up related to those kind of cumulative impacts of what's happening in Mill Valley and the rest of the of the county. Um, and I mentioned earlier that that environmental, um, the draft environmental review document is available for public comment and they're receiving public comment right now and have a, a workshop next week on Wednesday. Um, but the state has said to us that, um, you know, many communities around the state are, you know, we're not alone in having issues with water in California, right? This is happening around the whole state. So it's worth noting that the um, the state of California said that because of water shortages was not a, a reason for us not to plan for housing. And so we have to go through those, this we have to go through this planning exercise. And we also have to look at ways that we can address the water shortages that we have in our community. So for example, in Westmore, hold on just one second, please. Sorry, there's some background noise here. Um, that in Southern California, for example, they do a much better job at um, recycling water and the Bay Area is, is way behind. So there's opportunities around recycling water. There's also opportunities around expanding our storage for water. So um, those are some of the things that we have to look at for water, but obviously it's an ongoing challenge that, that we'll be facing and we can only develop housing if there is water available for them. Well, thank you. I hope they wait for that. And I, I know it's a complex issue. I listen to their Zoom meetings every month 
and say, okay, have you? I know it's controversial, but have you just looked into desalinization? And I don't even get an answer. And then somebody came okay, up. Okay, I'm sorry, Valerie. We 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 do need to move on because we have several other people who have other questions. But we'll come back to you if we're able to get through to theirs. Okay, okay. I'll, we'll come back to you. Okay, Thank you're very you. nice. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go on to Bruce and then Michael. Lily, can you hear me? No, I can't hear you. <laughs> um, I muted myself. Hi, yes, we can hear you. Okay, Bruce, go ahead. You. Thank you. I had uh, just a couple questions. Uh, one, um, the area between Strawberry and Tiburon, there's a there's a bay, and then there's a, a Richardson Bay on the other side of, of Strawberry. Are you noticing uh, any sea level rise in these areas? Now, and I don't, I don't hear an answer. Leslie, can you answer? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, in in the last, um, so well, let's start with the tide tide gauge at uh, the Golden Gate, which is the longest running tide gauge in the United States. So, for in the over the last hundred years, there, um, they've documented about nine inches, um, eight to nine inches of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's really what we're seeing right now. So um, it's really future sea level rise that is the concern. Okay, and, and just to follow up on that, you, you mentioned, uh, Leslie, 3.3 feet of rise. W what does that measure? Is that uh, like the danger zone? Or what, what is that 3.3 feet? Uh, is that feet compared to nine inches over the last 100 years? Yes, yes, it is. That is the state guidance that um, that we should be consistent with when we're planning for sea level rise. So, and um, with climate change, of course, the rate of sea level rise is expected to increase. Well, I think it's going to have to increase a lot. Um, uh, it would seem to me. Uh, I've lived in Strawberry for forty-five years, and when I see the low tide out in the bay, it's I mean, you can walk across. <laughs> I don't see evidence of sea level rise, but uh, uh, maybe. Um, anyway, it, it's a it's an issue, and I understand you have to look at it. Uh, my second question um, has to do with uh, with community plans versus the countywide plan. As it stands now, if a if a community plan is more specific, then it has uh, standing over the countywide plan, but it sounds to me, uh, Leslie, as though uh, the county planners are basically gutting community plans. And, and so my question then becomes, what is the point of having a community plan if you know, people who are really unfamiliar with strawberry, uh, you know, people who, who live in other areas are making rules for people here, uh, where we live. I mean, it just, to me, it's a complete gutting of local control. And, and to me, it looks like now we're just being state controlled. So I'd like to know what, what happens to community plans now? Do they have any standing whatsoever under your proposal to make the, the, the countywide plan the dominant plan? Um, yes, they will. So they they just won't be able to govern those specific things around um, density, um, FAR, those kind of thing. The, the, there's one other specific issue, but those those are the two main issues around density and FAR that the countywide plan is going to govern. And it's really to align it with we can't have policies in our in our community plans that. Um, have the effect of preventing multi-unit development that's inconsistent with what the state law requirements are. And so in order to do that, we have to, you know, there's, I think, 22 it, within the um, county. I think there's 22 community plans within the county. So that change is being made to affect all of them. And some of them will, it won't really have an effect as it relates to the housing element sites and sites needed to meet our arena. So it's not a blanket change. It's really made 
the, and this is, as you pointed out in your message earlier in, in the chat, that is what the planning commission and the board asked us to do was make it more focused. And so it's the goal of this is to apply to our housing element sites and sites needed to meet our arena. So it's, it, you know, if you're building a single unit home that isn't on one of the um, sites, then the, the, community plan would still apply and, you know, any design stuff that you had related to that would still be in effect. But we are um, making that change so that um, density and um, FAR would be established through the through the countywide plan rather than each community plan. Okay, well, thank you for that, Leslie. And I'll just, uh, I'll just conclude with this comment. Uh, CEQA, under CEQA, uh, People who live in a community are experts on their communities. They're recognized as experts. And what you're doing or what you're proposing is you're saying, well, you're not experts anymore. People in Sacramento are, people in other areas of the county are experts. And where you live, you're no longer an expert. Um, and I'm, I might also point out that Strawberry has more multifamily housing than just about any other unincorporated area in Marin County. And we're probably going to get a lot more because of the redevelopment of the former seminary property. Uh, and I, I just want to, I want to see an even um, distribution of housing within the unincorporated areas. And I'm, I'll, I'll wait to see that at the next, uh, the next hearing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment and, and that um, goal of align, having housing in all of our communities line, aligns with the board and plan, the direction that we got from the board and planning commission. So, sorry, Aline, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say we'll have Michael um, and then Bill. I see your hand is raised. And then there is one in the com comments that I want to read out as well. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, you addressed the question I put in the chat about uh, community-wide plans versus uh, community plans versus countywide. Just wondering if you can say a little bit more. Uh, I know when you know there was a, a language that seemed very broad that got many of us concerned that was discussed at that meeting. Um, and you've now you've explained how it, it sounds like it'll be narrower, uh, or, or maybe there was a misunderstanding. But sweeping language seems to set everything aside. Narrow language, you know, might focus on those density and housing issues that you you just mentioned. Can you help us understand where that language is going to be produced uh, as, so that when we see it, you know, we'll become believers? Yes. So the this, the proposal that we had brought that was discussed at the Board and Planning Commission, and I'm sorry, I can't remember what the date was, but it was, I believe, last month. Um, and we had proposed a limit, just having the countywide plan um, govern over community plans, as you said, in a, in, a, in a comprehensive way. And the Board and Planning Commission asked us to make it more specific and focused so that it applied to um, our housing element sites and sites needed to meet our arena. And so it's a much more specific thing. It's about density and FAR. And we have a workshop with um, the planning commission. Um, Aline's going to remind me the date. Um, but with that workshop with the planning commission, we'll have the actual attachment of the changes that we're recommending to the countywide plan and the zoning. And so that will be an opportunity to really dig into the details and comment on really specific language. Um, and that's in December. Aline, can you remind me the date? I'm looking it up now. I'll drop it okay. in the chat. Okay, she'll drop it in the chat. Sorry. Um, but thanks Great. for that question. Thank you very much. That helps. Bill, if you'd like to ask your question. There we are. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on on the necessity for uh, overall master planning. Uh, even though, uh, as a previous speaker mentioned, uh, I, well, I've lived in Mill Valley in the Tam Valley area for over 50 years, and uh, uh, granted, we tend to get 
believe we're the local experts, absolutely. But on the other hand, it's hard for us to accept the development that is absolutely necessary if we're going to be able to provide housing for our own future, uh, let alone affordable housing. And so uh, under those circumstances, I have to step back and say, okay, uh, we do have to begin to bite the bullet and develop areas that we would rather not see developed. Uh, as far as the Tam or uh, the, the strawberry area is concerned, uh, it was 50 years ago, uh, I was president of the Interfaith Housing Foundation when we built Shelter Hill. And it's on the hillside. It was throwaway land because it was too close to the freeway. We had a hard time getting it developed, passing all the hood criteria because of the sound. And we found a way of uh, reducing the effects of the sound from the freeway. And it's a beautiful place. There's plenty of property around that area that's also high enough to be above any future sea, uh, sea rise. So that too would be an opportunity for future development. But back in the day when we were looking at it, there was a big no growth uh, effort in Marin County Water District. Uh, people were hired to the Water District and created in very difficult development criteria to avoid growth. And let's, you know, we have to we have to accept it. It's going to be here. And as far as sea rise is concerned, that's science. Uh, the global warming and the fact that there will be sea rise, uh, even though you walk across Richardson Bay, I see it every morning when the tide is low. Uh, it doesn't appear to be sea rise uh, affecting it. But the fact of the matter is that eventually it's going to come. And if we don't plan for the next 50 years, then we're going to be in the same place that we are now because we weren't planning for this period of time 50 years ago. So um, um, I'm rambling a little bit, but I've been in the air for a long time. I was on the TAM Design Review Board for a number of years. Um, and I'm very simply wanting to see my TAM Valley change, but it's going to have to change. Um, I just wanted to add that one. Thanks. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for your comments and thanks for your work with Shelter Hill. I'm familiar with that property. Yeah, thank you. Oh, incidentally, I, I may have to leave soon. I'm sitting in the parking lot. We're about to go to the speaker series. So if you see me drop away, it's not because of lack of interest, but I will come back and review the tape version uh, okay. if I have to leave. All right, well, enjoy yourself. Thank you. Um, so I'll read out one more comment. We have a couple more minutes. So if others have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. I also see a hand from Edward, but I do want to read this comment. Um, Lily, how will the EIR, how will that the EIR impact? Uh, I think the question is, what will the EIR impact be on the housing element? Given we currently have a countywide, we have countywide water restrictions, I expect water will be a problem if the EIR states that will this report be revised accordingly? Yeah, so the, yeah, I think that's a good question. So the EIR is out, it's been released, it's been available for public review. Um, I dropped the link in the chat earlier and it it did find, and it found that the, that there were impacts on from the project that were, you know, couldn't be mitigated. And I'm probably not using the right CEQA language, so sorry if, if it's not exactly right, but they, they, they were, it found that there was impacts that, which could not be mitigated. And um, the, the way it works is they also study some alternatives in addition to the proposed project, which was our list of sites. And those alternatives include a no project, and then two alternatives um, that are intended to have less of an uh, impact on the environment. And so the board has, and the planning commission have that information. They'll hear from the public next week. And then when they, uh, they'll have the option of choosing one of those alternatives, which has less impact, there isn't any alternative that has no impact. Every single one has some impact around water, traffic, other issues. And so the board will have to make overriding findings to say, 
they want to adopt the housing element in order to comply with state law. But yes, it can inform them. They could make some changes. They could decide to move housing to different sites based on some of the information and recommendations. But if you really want to dig into the EIR, um, I would keep. I, I would suggest that you try to go next week on Wednesday, where you'll have people who are much more knowledgeable about that. You'll have the experts who prepared the document, and our environmental coordinator who can answer specific questions related to the environmental review and the environmental impacts. Thanks, Lily. Uh, Edward, I see your hand is raised. I think we'll take your question, and then if we have time, I'll read the one in the chat. And if Others have questions, you can drop them in the chat as well. Thanks. Uh, I apologize. This may be an ignorant question, but if I if I understood what you said, there are 22 communities working on these kinds of programs. Uh, uh, no, well, sorry. The 22 communities were community plans, which have different requirements that are specific to that community, like Strawberry or Tam Valley, and eat, there's 22 communities in the unincorporated community that have their own oh, 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 okay. specific plans. All right. So that actually uh, underlines my question. So there's that many communities within the unincorporated area. There's the county itself. Mm -hmm. Then there are all the all the re uh, respective cities that I presume are working on plans similar to this. Correct. Uh, and But you said that in mm -hmm. the environmental review is when uh, uh, there'd be a, a review, an overview of the coordination. And it just surprises me. Is there not some overarching coordination between all the cities and communities in the county within the county to make sure this all is happening in some coordinated fashion? So there is some coordination and I'm I don't I, I don't want to misspeak on it. There's so there's a part of the environmental review looks at a cumulative impact. So it looks at the whole impact. Um, and there is coordination. We have a, a group of us that are working on housing policies. So we coordinate around all of those with all the cities and towns. Um, we're trying to kind of reduce the effort that everybody is putting into it. Many of our cities and towns don't you know, they don't have people who are housing staff. And so they're trying to, you know, process applications and do this really complicated um, planning process. And so there's coordination there. Um, but each community has a plan for their share of housing. And in the county as a whole, it's 14,000 units, a little over 14,000 units, which are divided up between each of the cities and towns. And the unincorporated has to plan for about 3,500, as, as Aline mentioned. But each city and town, and this is just the requirement under the state law, is that each city and town has to plan for their share of housing. Oh, Edward, you're on mute if you had a last. One, one other quick question, and that is, if I, right at the beginning, I thought I heard that one of the challenges is that we've, that there is a reduction in funding to assist with traffic issues. That's if you don't adopt your housing element. If you, ah, if a that's city if there's decides not compliance. Not to. Yes, if you don't comply. Right. I see. Okay, right. I yes. apologize. Okay. That's all. No. Let's go to the question in the chat, Aline, and then we, we need to, oh. Yeah, I see Babette. Babette. Okay. Um, go ahead and ask your question, Babette. Oh, you are on mute. Okay. Can we unmute her? Let's see. We could do this. Oh, there we go. Okay. okay. You're good to go. Uh, in regard to the coordination or lack of coordination among cities, it seems to me that it's possible, say, for one city, to go in for fairly high density and they agree that that's okay for them, but the impact of traffic on the adjacent cities or 101 is nowhere considered in a holistic way, the way things are going. Well, every community has a plan for housing and whether they do it at a high, you know, at 
a variety of densities. It's, they still have to plan for that housing, but um, that overall traffic impact, and we have had our environmental review um, consultants all meet together and talk about a kind of a an approach around traffic. We also work with TAM, who is the Transportation Authority of Marin, who provides information about um, um, who, who provides that information around that guides us in in evaluating traffic. So there is coordination through the Transportation Authority of Marin oh. around around traffic impacts. What about impact? Say they're in the same high school district. That also. Um, is looked at through the environmental review. So if if there you're on mute, Lily. Sorry. Um, so if there's other questions people have, please email them to us. If we didn't get to any that are in the chat, we'll make sure that we answer those um, and send a response. I have it. Sorry, and I I have another meeting, and we have to let our interpreter go. Um, yeah, Laura, we so, will follow up with you via email for your question. Yeah, and if yeah, others we'll, have questions, I've dropped our emails in the chat. Okay, great. And we have your your um, we have your emails that are in the chat. We have your yeah. email, so we'll send back responses. And then please take advantage of the meetings that we have have let you know about. Check our website; everything is on there. Probably more information than you would ever want to know about housing or safety element planning, but please um, take a look there and, and attend some of our future meetings. We really thank you for your interest and sorry to rush you off, but we do have to let our, our interpreter go and, and I actually have to go to another meeting. So I really appreciate everybody's time and your really thoughtful, good questions. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.